Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Want to welcome you here, whether you're sitting out there in the pews, you're out there in internet land. If you are on, in internet land, please like, share, leave a comment, um, you know, tell everybody about it. So, anyway, uh, heard a story this week. Actually, this is this is from my wife. So if you don't like it, blame her. <laughs> there was this little little country church out in the middle of the sticks, you know, and it had a creek that ran behind the church that was deep enough to do baptisms. So the preacher, preacher at the time, he said, you know, I'm going to start doing all the baptisms out there in the creek. Go back to the old days, you know. And, and uh, so they had a guy that was wanting to be baptized. So after the church service, they took him out the back. The preacher and him waited out in the creek about waist deep. And he, you know, grabbed a hold of him and, and said, you know, the Son, the Father, and the Holy Ghost and dipped him in the water, pulled him up. He looked at the guy, and the pastor goes, well, did you see Jesus? He said, no. Pastor dunked him again, held him a little longer, pulled him up. Said, Did you see Jesus? The guy again said, No. So this time he put him under, he held him longer and longer, and the guy started fighting him and everything, you know. And so he pulled him back up, said, Well, did you see Jesus that time? He goes, No. Are you sure this is where he went under? <laughs> All right, so. Monday at 1 p.m. is WM yearly planning meeting. Um, at 6 to 8 p.m. on Monday is uh, live training for a real encounter at the Pike County Fairgrounds. Next Sunday at 3 to 5 p.m. is a community gospel sing at the Pike County Fairgrounds. July 29th at 5 p.m. real encounter at the Pike County Fairgrounds. July 31st is our Lord's Supper. August 1st through 5th is Children's Camp, Camp Inlow, Summer Fun and Activities, grades 3rd through 6th. August the 3rd, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. is Day Camp at Camp Inlow, grades 1 through 3rd, Missions, Craft, Bible Study, uh, Swimming and Games. Our shoebox items is clothing items. The noisy Offering goes to Missouri Baptist Children's Home. And the WOM Mission Action is Quarters for the VA Home. And Prayer Meeting at 6.30 tonight. Is there any other announcements? Keep on the 13th and free lunch. We're going to have a birthday party for one that should be 80, and then her sister Bev will be 75, so we're combining it, and it's going to be in Main Bay. And it's true for the First Baptist Church. Okay. What day was that again? August 13th. August 13th. Okay. Any other announcements? How about birthdays, anniversaries? Well, let's go to Noisy Offering. That's all. Well, we do have uh, another beautiful day outside. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one thing I noticed. We came out yesterday to set up all the equipment, and we kicked up a lot less dust this morning than we did yesterday. <laughs> So uh, that's always a good thing. But uh, what's really a good thing is to be able to spend time worshiping our Lord. So let's go to our Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've got together this morning, this opportunity to come and worship you in song, 
prayer, study of your word. And we just pray, Father, that you would use this service in a mighty way, that you would touch our hearts, bring us closer to you, and that we might be a light to a dark world. We ask, Father, for your guidance on this day. We ask, Father, that you give safety of travel to, to those that find themselves out on wet roads. And we do thank you sincerely, Father, for the rain. We offer this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Roma, we didn't have creeks in the boot hill of Missouri where I grew up. Uh, there may have been some, but none, at least in the portion of it where I lived, because it was flat down there. But we had mostly drainage because at one time, you know, that was all underwater back there, and they were more interested in getting water out of there than doing anything else. But it reminded me of my own baptism. I was baptized in a drainage, those, one of those drainage ditches, and the width of that thing could be, or, or the width of those ditches was, they even had, some of them were named and some of them were numbered, depending on where on the map they were located, like number one, number two, and number three. And they were vital for, to open up some of that good farm ground just to get rid of the water, to get the water into the Mississippi and on down south. But the, they were, they were, uh, uh, valuable for recreation. We we kids went swimming there often. Uh, there were picnics and outings and that on certain places on them. And then they served purposes as a baptistry because there were no creeks and there were in those days were no baptistries. It just my mind was I was I was entertaining myself thinking <laughs> thinking what uh, was going on there. I just wondered. Is there any of you who have never seen a baptism anywhere that, other than a baptistry? All of, in other words, all, all of you have seen baptisms. That, that's what I meant to say. Is that at, what I said? At the camp, they do it in the uh, swimming pool. A swimming pool? A regular they, yeah, swimming they pool? They do it on their children's, children's and teens camp. They, really? Uh, now, I've never seen that either. Yeah. And then uh, I've got friends that uh, visited River Jordan, and uh, we've got pictures of them getting baptized in the River Jordan. Wow, that would be that would be something, wouldn't it? To see a baptism there. Not very many years ago, one of my employees uh, was saved, and he was baptized, and he invited us to come to the baptism, and we went up here uh, into uh, Spencer Creek. But it was, we had to, we turned and drove off the main access and went down there in the middle of, I kind of called it the middle of nowhere, but it was really meaningful. It had a special meaning because of where it was, you know. I, I'm not, I'm not uh, talking against the baptistry. They're a wonderful thing for us to have, but uh, the being, sometimes we allow highlights to get by us without us really absorbing and uh, being baptized to me was very meaningful because I was in moving water and I don't remember how many would, were baptized that day but I can remember after a two-week revival pastor in the teens of being baptized in one one service now that was back when like I said we had two-week revivals and numerous people would come to know the Lord and those baptisms were the highlight of the whole thing you know the kind of the climax at the end so I won't charge you anything for that that was just on my mind and, I, and didn't I, lose a single one right huh and didn't lose a single nobody one. left oh you mean in the water <laughs> yeah. either way we didn't lose anyone <laughs> no absolutely all right turn with us and turn with us and let's sing Jesus uh, see Jesus is all the world to me, 475. Let's stand as we sing. And Kathy, I'm going to ask you to lead us after we lead us in prayer after we finish this song. Jesus is all the world to me.
Blessed be the name, 310. Blood can make the foulest clean. 
Timothy, starting at 587. Take time to be holy, 587. up a doctor's appointment and him asking me if I needed any pain medication I said I think I'm fine but Kim's gonna have to take care of me you got anything she might, um, she might take um, and you know especially when it comes to them I don't know why it's the minor stuff you know the uh, but uh, you know Jerry I have to re I have to always remind myself that just because I have a frog in my throat does not mean I'm going to croak <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, so that, that was a, uh, you know, I really expected someone to do the brumpum, but okay. Um, so anyway, this week, I uh, kind of want to talk about, uh, you know, idle hands are, you know, idle hands make idle hands. Um, the idols that, the idols, I-D-O-L-S, that make us idle, I-D-L-E. Um, Last week, we kind of talked about two people. We talked about King David, and we also talked about his son, King Solomon. And David has 
always fascinated me um, for many reasons, but one in particular, and we're going to get to that here very briefly uh, this morning. I do want to acknowledge Dr. Odell Belger, who gave some of the thoughts towards this. He is a 50-year um, pastor in South Carolina, and has uh, I've always appreciated uh, any opportunity to read his uh, stuff. But if you would please turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11, and we'll be there in just a couple of minutes. But let's lay some groundwork regarding King David. So even before the verses that we're going to get to go uh, into here shortly, there's a number of things that have already been established about King David even before now. Um, first off, he was extremely noble. There was no one considered more noble than David. He was a gifted musician. That's how he came to be in the king's court. He was a humble man of God, and, and that was well recognized by everybody. He turned out to be a great administrator. Everything he put his hand to worked exactly the way it was supposed to. He absolutely loved the Lord. They knew that then. We know this now because many of the Psalms were actually written by him. And then he was a man of courage. And no one debates that. I mean, after all, that's what really brought him into the limelight when he, when the army was challenged by a nine-foot soldier by the name of Goliath. And he would take him on. So he was a man of courage. And, but I, I, I really think that many of you, like I, always fall back on the one thing David is most known for. And that is, as the Bible describes him, a man after God's own heart. Now, I don't know about you, but I would love to have that on my tombstone. Amen. You know, not that I'm in any hurry. You know, it's, it's no need to go out there and buy a tombstone. But, um, but, uh, you know, a man after God's own heart. Um, by the way, totally rabbit trailing you here. Um, I read these, I read a lot of sermons and training materials on the course of the week, and you can read about the author. And they'll, you know, like they'll like tell you not where he preaches at, or what, you know, for instance, Dr. Belger here. And then, but one of the questions they'll ask him is, you know, like, do your does your wife like your sermons? Or um, or you know, your family. But one of the questions that they ask is the one I just answered. What would you like on your tombstone? And one preach one preacher said, pepperoni. <laughs> oh, oh golly, dude. <laughs> but anyway, um so uh but in the the apostle Paul, see now I'm told now I gotta come back to the serious stuff. Huh? Um but anyway, the, the Apostle Paul wrote um, about God's feelings towards King David. In Acts 13, he says, After removing Saul, he made David their king. He testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And that's what it's really about, right? Doing what God wants us to do. You know, in our, I was thinking about that during um, our Sunday school lesson this morning, where, you know, Elijah just kind of needed to re be reminded that, you know, the, the work wasn't done. He hadn't seen the finished product yet. He needed to continue doing what God wanted him to do. So, but here, and here's kind of my, my big thing about David. When you think about this great man of God, this man after God's own heart. How is that possible? I mean, David committed the sins of lust, adultery, murder. How can, that, can both of those exist? And that is the question I kind of want us to talk about today. Because knowing the answer to that answers an age-old question that at some point or another goes through the mind and the heart of every single Christian. 
Every Christian that has exist, does exist, will exist. Now, and the problem is, is because we look at those two and we think, well, they're incompatible. So it can't be. You can't be a person after God's own heart and be a sinner. And so you can't be a loyal, true blue Christ worshiper, Christ worshiper, and still be a sinner. And of course, Satan, he's actually all on board with that. You're you know, he'll tell you, you're absolutely right. So obviously, you're not. You're not born again because you still sin. So you're, you know, you could you could go to church, but don't try to do any Lord's work because you're a poser. Anybody ever had that that running through your mind, running through your heart? Just about every Christian has. And yet, when we sit down with our Bible in true meditation, we sit down and pray, we can recognize in our own hearts that it's not true. We're not posers, but we are frail. We make mistakes, and sometimes over and over and over again. There is, at my work site, right outside my office, small hallway, and then the the printer. We have what's called a community printer. Anybody else got one of those? Where like everybody prints to that same printer. Yeah, yeah. So we have this community printer. Anyway, so I'll hit print and then get distracted onto the next thing. And whatever I sent on the printer sits there until someone walks by and any mothers you've given this look to your child so if you don't know what the look looks like ask them Dan is this yours yes did it again thank you um, they're, they're, I don't know what it is I just forget about it even though it's right there I can hear it when it's printing but usually I get distracted before I get up and go out there well you know allowing ourselves to get Distracted happens to everybody. Ministers, missionaries, deacons, choir members, Sunday school teachers, you name them, they get distracted. So if you look through biblical history, you're going to see that that's not a new thing. That's always existed. Stumbling blocks that Maybe they go by a different name now than what they used to go by uh, back then, but they're still stumbling blocks, things that uh, we still stumble over today, or maybe they're new things that we stumble over, but still, they're there. So my purpose today is for you to understand that the things that happened to David still happen to us, still are going to happen to us. And that is, quite honestly, one of the beautiful things about this book. It doesn't try to gloss it over. It doesn't try to make all the heroes seem like, well, they're just, you know, superheroes, that they can't, they're, you know, unable to do any wrong. You pick any Bible hero, and, and there's, there's a backstory. They were not perfect. But the great thing is that the one they served was. We have a tendency as human beings to play around with sin. The problem is Satan is not playing. You all remember the story of Samson. Samson had a had a problem. He liked his women. And so he, against his parents' wishes, was had uh, uh, Delilah. Well, the problem is Delilah wasn't playing. At one point, she had a mission. And that's when Samson learned that 
playing with fire gets you burned. You all might remember the, the um, there was a commercial. It was back in the 1980s. And I almost started to, to bring it and post it, but then I was afraid of, you know, copyright infringement and stuff like that. But, so, but maybe you might remember it. It was a commercial from the 1980s, and it showed this young man, and he's running. And when you see it, you, you assume he's you know, in a race, because of the way, I mean, he's booking it running. You know, and so it kind of looks like he's in a race until all of a sudden you see this police officer catch up to him, grab him, and tackle him to the ground. You know, it then goes on to show this young lady um, twirling around and a uh, little girl boy saying, I want to be a ballerina when I grow up. And that voice is saying that as this twirling young lady passes out and falls to the ground. The, co the commercial is reminding everybody, nobody grows up wanting to be a drug addict. And of course, we've got drug addicts out there, don't we? Did they start that way? No. No, of course not. And whatever drug they are on, you can pretty well guarantee that they didn't start with that drug either. They started playing around with something else. Something that was either they thought harmless or, I'm, you know, it, it, it's... Yeah, it, it hurts people, but it's not going to hurt me. And uh, and teenagers, they call that the teen fallacy, just in case you know, you're curious. The teen fallacy is that you're bulletproof. Now, you don't say you're bulletproof, but your actions say you're bulletproof, because you do stuff that if you realized your own mortality, you wouldn't be doing it. Sin happens the exact same way. One step at a time. Now the Bible does tell us exactly how it happened to David in this particular instance. So we're going to look at 2 Samuel chapter 11 and for the moment we're just going to read verses 1 through 3. It says, And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So, from, I mean, just at that point alone, you know this is not going well. Okay? But there's, <coughs> there's an interesting point. There's actually a lot of interesting points. In the, uh, there's a place in the Bible where it talks about um, about uh, David's 30, 30 fiercest warriors, and it names them. And these are the ones that you know were basically leading his army, his top of the top. And, and of course, you know this because he actually names them, and there's thirty of them. You know whose name makes that list? Uriah the Hittite. So this is the wife of one of his key people. Okay? Another thing to notice here. It's evening. Okay? Not night. It is evening. And David was in bed and got up. Now there's a lot of conjecture here about why David wasn't with his army. I mean, after all, doesn't it start off when kings are with their army? But he's obviously not. So there's a lot of conjecture here as to why he wasn't. And then there's, of 
course, also conjecture about Bathsheba. Why was, uh, why was she bathing at a time when she was visible to anybody that might be up there? Now, keep in mind, though, that Uriah wouldn't have lived in a one-story flat. You know, it's not like she was in the hot tub in the backyard. You know, this was up. And it would also make sense that David's castle would be higher. But still, light enough to see her. And the truth is, regardless, it really doesn't matter. David knew he was wrong. So the end result is that David wound up doing something he shouldn't have been doing. Now, there was, uh, when Dr. Belger talked about this, he would, he would go on to a, a litany of things that were going on here, but there's one that I want to talk about. Idleness. And the reason that idleness strikes, strikes me so odd is because of, I guess because of the irony of it. Many of you, like I, sometime today, we're just going to sit back and say, ah, chance to get our breath. Maybe you turn on some TV to just kind of let your mind go a little bit. You know, you, you do something to just kind of let the stress out. Well, there's a difference between being, you know, seeking some peace and quiet and being idle. But when you really think about it, if you seek peace and quiet for like a very, 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 very long time, what is it? Being idle. I mean, the whole idea of peace and quiet is that you're not really doing much. Now, of course, we call it different things. Some people actually do call it peace and quiet. Maybe we call it downtime. Maybe we call it chill time. Um, and there are other terms, but the fact is we want just a period of time to be idle. So I want you to understand that those brief moments aren't really what we're talking about because everybody needs that, that time to recharge, right? But there's a difference when that continues for a period of time. As in the case of David, <coughs> who it is evening and he's getting up out of bed. So your highness, what have you been doing all day? You know that it's, it's not even night yet. You can still see outside and you're getting up and you're, and you're clearly not where you should have been for whatever reason. There's a saying that says, getting too much of a good thing is a bad thing. And that's absolutely true. To include chill time. Too much leads to a life of idleness and we're strongly encouraged against it in scripture. There's another saying that says, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. Unfortunately, we all know that one. We've been there, we've seen it, and it has proven itself time and time again, not only in our own lives, but in the lives of those close to us, to be quite accurate. And let's face it, if David had been doing something, anything, out with his men or anything else, this would not have come about. There is a parable commonly called the parable of the cows. And it's in Luke 19, but it talks about this. Um, Jesus is sharing this story that the, because the people at that time they thought that even, and I'm talking about those that thought he was the Messiah, they thought that he was there to set up his kingdom. Then, right then, that there was, there was going to be an insurrection or a revolt or 
or something something was going to happen and he was going to take over Jerusalem and, uh, and the nation right then and he, so he tells this story about a nobleman who's going away to a far country and um, that he's going to come back at some point but until he does he calls his ten servants together and he gives them ten pounds but he makes this comment he says occupy till I come I see we tend to think of occupy like you know like just be present you know, you know, you know just occupy a space um, but that's not what occupy is actually a military term a country that is occupied is taken over you know those those soldiers don't just you know stand there and wait for someone to tell them what to do they are making sure things are right they're making sure things are in order they're establishing order they're slowly changing things to the way they do things so I mean an occupied country doesn't mean that you've got enemy forces hanging out in tents somewhere that, and so when, he's, when they say occupy till I come that's what they're talking about you're in there you're actually doing something it's that same word that uh, we sometimes use to talk about your job we call your job your occupation you go into a place and you sit there for eight hours and at the end of eight hours you get up and walk out right no that's not the way it works at all you go there and you're doing something you're making a difference you're changing things So an occupation, whether it be your job or uh, taking over a country, or as Jesus was telling them, occupy till I come, it means that you're going somewhere and you're, you're busy. You're doing something until, in this case, he returns. Because the truth is, if we aren't busy for God, Satan's going to give you something else. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And when the devil walks about, seeking who he may devour, how does he pick his people? How does he pick his victims? idleness he looks for people that aren't wrapped up in the Lord's work or in other work idleness being I-D-L-E leads you to following I-D-O-L now that sounds let me tell you that the reason the devil can't enter into your life when you're a busy Christian is you just, it's not because you're super holy. It's because you just don't have time for that silliness. You've got other things you need to do. And that's true of all of us. We have, even, even those that are saved, still have a sinful nature. I always find it interesting that when you ask someone um, about coming to church, a lot of times, I, you know, I don't know, I don't think so. I don't think I've ever asked someone about coming to church and them say, no, I'm really not interested, and leave it at that. Usually it's, I've got this going on, or I've got that going on, or, you know, there, there's, they're too busy for church, is what they're really trying to say. Now, most of them won't say those words, but they're too busy for church. And you have to ask yourself, is that really a thing? You know, you go to church to worship God. Are you really so busy that you can't worship your Creator? Wow, you must be pretty important.
there is, and I apologize, I have forgot the term. There is a group of people who are growing in the divorce court. And they are referred to, and I'm not getting this exactly right, but they are referred to somehow as the gray crowd. And what they are talking about is people that have been married 30 or more years who are now getting a divorce. And the reason they're getting divorced is because now that they have time to spend with each other, you know, rather than all that busyness, they're realizing, I don't really know if this is the person I want to spend the rest of my life with. Well, nothing's really changed. What's changed is that they've allowed themselves to get idle. Now, please, none of you go and tell your significant other that I suggested maybe you want to get divorced. Um, but retirement isn't meant to be a time of idleness. It's a time meant for different responsibilities. Some of our biggest um, and strongest people in the Salt River Baptist Association are actually retirees. And yet, you wouldn't know it to see them. They are very active in church ministry and choirs and extracurricular activities where they are lifting up God's people. We aren't meant to be idle. And if we are, then we're a target. So what I want you to understand is that your free time really isn't free time. Just like any time you are going to spend it, you're going to waste it, or you're going to do something else with it. Whose glory is it going to benefit? It's going to be yours? It's going to be the devil's? It's going to be God's? So, I'm not saying don't have any free time. I'm just saying recognize that you're here for a purpose and to utilize your time wisely and to enjoy the richness in our lives that God has given us because life is really meant to be a beautiful thing and don't let that escape you. Brother Jerry? Six, two, five, six.
You can search, you can buy, and try everything that they are It is Christ, only Christ, who is his life more abundant, and he calls from God. It was there on Calvary, God fears so. So as you uh, go through this week, I encourage you to be blessed by the world around you, to uh, understand what a, a gift we have, and to uh, try to stay by, I guess. But uh, as far as other announcements, we do have our prayer meeting tonight at 6.30. Are there any other items that either were not mentioned before or bear repeating? The WOM meeting will be at 1 o'clock and not 2 o'clock tomorrow. Okay. Because we're having our planning. Okay. Is it here at the area? Or right here at the church? One o'clock instead of two. Okay. Uh, Keith Donaldson is your prayer. Uh, he has been uh, talking about getting his fire training updated uh, further, and someone has offered his scholarship to the firefighters, and he applied, and hopefully he will get his scholarship so he can take it. Okay. okay. Great. All right then. Carl, could I ask you to give our closing prayer? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to come together. Please, anytime we come together, that it would be your will that we would concentrate on the things that you would have us do, that we could better our lives for you. Help us to keep that in mind in all we do. Jesus, blessed name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.